So today, we're going to be picking up in Mark chapter 10, going back to where Cody left off in Mark. So yeah, if you have your Bible, open up to Mark chapter 10. We'll be starting at verse 13. Have you guys enjoyed the snow? I don't think anyone has more than my dog. Take him out to play fetch in the snow, and like, we live up by like Tolman Creek, the top part of Tolman, and we go to like Bellevue, and there was like... It felt like this much deep of snow, like knee high basically. And he loves just playing fetch, like with his frisbee. Just see him bounding around. Like I even had a, we take him inside and he just, before we get into the house, he just lays on the ground and starts crying. And he's like, no, I'm not. Like loves the snow so much. I love the snow too. But anyways, let's, pr- uh, let's pray again and we're going to dive into the word. So Lord, we just thank you so much for this time that we get to come and get in your word. Lord, I thank you for such a powerful worship service. Thank you for, for uh, Jerry and just anointing him for worship, Lord. And God, as we open up your word, we just pray that you would soften our hearts, Lord. Give us ears to hear what you have to say, Lord. Would you just bless this time in Jesus' name? Amen. So we left off on Cody's awesome message of marriage. That was uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through Verses 1 through 12. And if you are a married person, you should go watch that. It's on our live stream. Uh, it's on the app, I'm pretty sure. And uh, if, you're, if you're not married, if you're wanting to get married, you should also go watch it. Um, if you're not wanting to get married, but maybe the Lord would have it, go watch it. It was just a great message for everybody. So make sure you go back, listen to that. But today, so with marriage... I know for myself, I'm newly married. This is, we're going on our third year of being married. Um, yeah, three, three years and two kids. Crazy. Um, but a lot of good things come from um, marriage. And I know for myself that marriage makes me a better person. Um, it's hard. It's, it's work. It's, it's, it's amazing, though. It's an awesome experience. There's so much fun and joy and love. And um, marriage really does make you a better person. I was thinking about people that are married in the Bible. And I thought of Boaz, and marriage really does make you a better person, because before Boaz was married, he was actually ruthless. Yeah, yeah. A f- laughter on the screen, like the laughing thing. Um, I'm a new dad, as I said, so my dad jokes are getting better. Um, but you guys get that, because Ruth was his wife, and before Ruthless. <laughs> So with marriage, marriage is when, two, when a man and a woman are sitting in a tree, K-S-S-I-N-G, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby and a baby carriage. So today, we're talking about children. We're picking up in verse 13, Jesus is blessing the children. So Mark chapter 10, verse 13, then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, He was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. In Luke's um, gospel of of this story, he says infants. And as a new parent, um, this was really speaking to me that we as parents, we need to bring our kids to Jesus, seek opportunities to bring our kids to Jesus. And it doesn't matter how young they are because God knew you before the foundations of the earth, right? And he says that he brings the infants. So it's not like there's like a, a time in your life when it's like, okay, now Jesus cares about you and now he wants to pour into your life. He wants to bless your children even as their infants, as their babies. And it also it starts to, it's speaking about younger, younger kids too, like teenagers, right? They can be hard to love sometimes, but Jesus loves them, right? Jesus loves our kids. He wants to bless them. Verse 14 says, But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, So when Jesus saw the disciples rebuking these these parents, bringing their kids to Jesus, this is a a really deep um, theological word. You might want to write it down, look it up later. I actually came up with it. It's, it's called a re-rebuke. This is what Jesus does. Because he rebuked the disciples' rebuke. It's called a re-rebuke. Um, just memorize that word. Pray about it. 
that basically he rebuked the disciples. And maybe Jesus at this time was thinking, guys, do you not remember what I said last chapter? If we look back last chapter, Jesus is like, do you not remember Mark chapter 9, verse 32, or verse 37, where I said, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. He's like, guys, also remember what I said in verse 42. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So big point from today, from this, this part so far, is we, Jesus really cares about kids. He loves children. And don't, call, don't get in the way of children and young people coming to Jesus. Don't get in the way. That's, that's a no-no, right? Disciples should have known better. Jesus had to remind them, guys, I love children. Don't hold back young people from Jesus. In verse 14, it says, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So this is important. We're, we're called to have childlike faith. Not childish faith, but childlike faith. And there's two big aspects that um, I've, I've found when I was studying this of childlike faith. And the first is trust. Children trust their parents, right? I, like I said, I'm, in, I'm a new, uh, newlywed, new father. I'm also just a young adult. I'm only 23 years old. So I'm a pretty young guy. And adulting is hard. And it's confusing, like insurance and what covers all these things and, you know, all, all the things that comes with the car insurance. There's, there's insurance for everything, home insurance. You can get dog insurance, I found out. Uh, there's insurance for everything, right? And then, like, paying your rent and your phones and all the bills. And there's so much stuff that comes with being an adult that's really confusing, right? And as a kid, it is, it's so nice because you, you don't wake up in the morning before school when you're in fifth grade and be like, huh, did my dad pay rent or did my dad... Did, you know, did he pay the insurance for the car we're going to be able to drive? Or did he get the license plates registered? And like all this crazy stuff. Like, no, you just, you trust, the, you trust your parents, right? You know, wake, wake up and be like, is there going to be food on the table? If you have a good parents, right? We tr- the kids trust. They don't have to worry about that stuff because they know daddy's going to take care of us. And yes, becoming an adult, there's lots of reasons To be worried, there's lots of reasons to be confused, to get stressed out, especially these past couple years, confusing times with wearing masks as a part of the fashion and all this stuff, with COVID and politics. It just seems like it's getting crazier, and there's a lot of reasons to worry, but we're called to live like children and trust our Father. Even when we don't understand everything, we're still called to live in trust of our Father because He cares for us and He loves us. The second The second quality marked of childlike faith is enjoyment. Kids enjoy the love of their father freely and their parents. So a lot of you guys have children, and it was just Christmas time. So you're back. Let's, let's, let's uh, rewind the clock a little bit. We're in, it's Christmas Day, Christmas morning. You wake up, probably to your kids jumping on your bed, and, Dad, it's Christmas, and, you know. That's what we, I used to do. I, used, I think I was the first one up every time, four in the morning, like, like Christmas, boom. But anyways, you have your hot chocolate or whatever. You get down, you sit around the tree, you start passing out the gifts. The, 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 your kids are ripping open the gifts, you know. And then how many of you, your kids open up the gifts, and then they're like, they give it back to you, and they're like, I can't take this right now. I need to go clean my room. I need to go do the dishes. I need to, I need to look at all my, the things I've been naughty with, and I need to go apologize to all these people and to you. No, right? Your kids are like, woo! They just start playing with the toys, and then they like throw the next toy and get another one, and then they just keep opening it, and it's so exciting. Um, it's, it's awesome. I know that was with my daughter. It was hard to, because she's only like 18, she's only 18 months, so gifts are kind of weird. She didn't really know. She's like, it's just a box, like, until we open it, and then she's like, oh, that's kind of fun. Anyways, it was a fun Christmas. Um, but kids, they enjoy the love and the gifts freely, Right? And we're called to do the same. Romans 8.1. I don't know if you have that up, Jonah. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
And this is true for us. Because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, we can enjoy his grace freely. There's no condemnation. And that's, that's, a, that's a mark of childlike faith that we're supposed to have. Verse 16. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. Now, if you read like the Greek versions of these words, and the, you, you learn a lot of cooler things. So here is actually, it's a fervent, fervent bless. Sorry, I'm stumbling on my words. It's an intense bless. It's, like a, it's not a regular bless. It's like a super blessed, right? He it blessed these children immensely because he loves them. It's not, it's not a regular bless. It's a super bless. Is Cody just regular excited? <laughs> no. Cody is super excited, right? Sorry, Cody. That's what you get for making fun of my other. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just joking. Sorry, Cody. But he super blessed these kids because he loves children. And maybe, maybe it was because the disciples were like rebuking them. And then he's like, hey, boys, check this out. Super blessed. And then he's like, take, write that down in the gospel. It's a super blessed, okay? Jesus super blessed them. And I love it in verse 14. It says, let the children come to me. So let the children come to me. These, these parents, I love the faith of the parents to bring their kids to Jesus. And the kids, it says, let them come to me. He, he, Jesus says, let them come to me. They want to go to Jesus. Unlike Santa Claus, Jesus is approachable. You guys have been to the mall. You've heard the screams of the kids with Santa, right? But Jesus is approachable. And Jesus loves children. And do we have any basketball fans in, in here today? Yeah, we got some basketball. You can raise your hand if you're... Not that many? Wow, okay. Did you guys feel like football fans or something like that? I don't know. We're going to talk about basketball for a little bit. So I'm a Bulls fan, okay? Are there Bulls fans? There's none in first service. And there's none. That's okay. Okay, what about Lakers? Are there any Lakers fans? One, okay, my dad, All right? <laughs> Two, <laughs> yeah. We got a few, and so I'm just going to apologize now, Okay. I'm going to be saying, I'm not dissing the Lakers or anything. I'm just explaining why they're not good this year. Um, and so I, the Lakers have been good in the past. They're just not doing good this year. And we're going to talk about, we're going to, we're going to, the Bulls, we're going to talk about the Bulls and the Lakers, why the Bulls are doing well and why the Lakers aren't. Okay, so the Bulls, they made a smart move a few years back. A few years back, they were not good. The Bulls were not a really good team, but now they are. And the reason is because they invested in young players. They had a lot of rookies. They had um, a lot of people that weren't in the NBA that long. But they took their chances on these young people. And, the, and the, a few good things about these young players is they have fresh bodies, which means they will last. They will get hurt less. They will able to do more. They're capable of more. They can jump higher, run faster, do all these things, right? They're just, they're more capable than an older player in the NBA. They're teachable. This is another thing. They're young. They're wanting to learn. They're coachable, right? They want to grow. They want to succeed. So they're learning from their coaches. They're learning from the older players on the team. And the third thing is, this is a big one, that they're, they're willing to grow together as a team and create unity and learn how to play together as a team. They, I, I know this for myself and my, uh, when I played basketball in high school, we were the, the varsity team when I was a sophomore. It was mainly, so, we only had one senior, I believe. The rest were like sophomores and freshmen. And we did not do good that year. I think we only won like three or four games. But then after playing together, getting unified, learning how to, and growing, then we went to the state championships, which was the first time in like 20 years, and it was a cool experience. But that's sort of what this Bulls team is doing. They're learning how to play together. They've been playing together for three years together, and they, they're learning, and they're being unified as a team. And with the Lakers, so I'm going to just apologize again, and I'm not calling, if, I'm going to throw some ages out there. The, these, the, these ages are not old for regular people. This is just for the NBA. So if you're in the NBA and you're this old, you're, you're this, the, of this age, you're not old, um, then, it, yeah, you're not old if you're this age, but in the NBA, you're going to retire soon is what it means. So they, 
when they started, that when this, the, this year started, I was like, there's no way, they, that, there's no one who can beat the Lakers this year. They have LeBron James, okay? They have Carmelo Anthony. These guys are superstars. They're all stars, right? They have Rajon Rondo. They have DeAndre Jordan. They have Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, and Dwight Howard. But they're not doing this good this year. The Bulls right now are seated one in the Eastern Conference, and they're seated around seven or eight, I think. So they're not doing super great. And I was like wondering, I was like, why are they, why are they not doing good? I thought they were going to be super good. But then I was like, wait, LeBron is 37 years old. That's not old. See, this is what I'm saying. If you're older than that, I'm not, there's nothing against you. But in the NBA, if you're playing 80 games in the regular season every single year for 20 years, I played one game of basketball this year, and I almost broke my foot. And I could barely move the next day, so I was so sore. So imagine doing that. Yeah, anyways, you get it. Carmelo Anthony's also 37. Rondo's 35. Jordan, Jordan is 33. Westbrook, the youngest superstar, is 28 years old. And in the NBA, that you're getting, that, that's like kind of older in the NBA. But anyways, some of their downfalls are their bodies aren't able to do what they used to be, right? Russell Westbrook used to be one of the best dunkers in the NBA, and he got rim-checked three games in a row. They're getting hurt, as older people do, just because their, body, their bodies are, you know, get deteriorating. But another big thing is, is, since they're all superstars, since they've been in the game a long time, they know how to play, and they all want to be the coach. They're not teachable. They're not coachable. Two of their players got in a fight in a game. Oh, they're on the same team, on the fights. They were about to throw fists at each other. Crazy, right? They're not able to grow in that unity just because of their own pride and how they take the game. So the, the thing with the Bulls, why they're doing well, is they have some superstars on their team that are older, but they're surrounded by young, young, younger players and they're pouring into those people. They're coaching up that team. They're being used in, in an awesome way with this team. And they're growing the team up instead of just a bunch of people who know everything there is about the sport and, and the fighting and the bickering. That, that's why the Bulls are doing good. So I'm sorry if you're a Lakers fan. You can leave, but I would encourage you to stay. Um, <laughs> but we, anyway, this is such an important text, I think, in the Bible because it shows that Jesus loves the youth, loves the youth. And that means he involves them. The second thing is Jesus involves the youth in his ministry. The disciples didn't want them in to come, right? They rebuked them. But Jesus said, no, let the children come. And this is in the Bible more than once. Our children, right? Jesus invites them into the ministry. And yes, the, chil- the children now are, they're the future of the church, right? But if they're not part of the church now, they're not going to feel like they're the future of the church. We need to invite the youth to be part of the church now. They need to know that they're part of the church now. So what, in this new year, I know personal growth is a big thing. Resolutions to get, you know, slim down or quit that addiction or whatever it is. Um, but really, what are ways that I can pour into someone, into someone the younger me, maybe younger in the faith than me? What are ways that I can invest in young people in the church? How can I grow someone um, with Christ, right? That's something that you guys should be praying about, and I'm praying about too. Or who, and who is it? Be specific with Lord. Lord, is there a certain person in our church that I should be pouring into? So verse 17 Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. So we go from children who, in this 
point of time in history, they didn't really add much to society, right? They didn't have money. They weren't, like, working. Maybe some of them were. But they were viewed as low in the society. Now we're talking about a guy who basically everybody strives to be. This man was young. He was healthy. He was rich, had lots of money, and he was powerful. If you guys ever read the TSV version of the Bible, Taylor Swift version, it also says that he's tall, dark, and handsome. I'm just joking. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I'm a youth pastor, so you're going to get a lot of uh, jokes. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep going, Wesley. Don't tell me to stop. <laughs> uh, so verse 17, now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So this man, as we said, was rich. He was young and healthy. He was powerful. He was a ruler, right? It seems like he had it all. In today's world, that's sort of what everybody strives for, right? It's to be super healthy. You always want to be trimming down, looking super buff, and and you want to have lots of money so you can buy whatever you want, and you want people to respect you, right? That's that's sort of like the dream for, for the society and the world, right? So this man had it all. He had all of those things. But in verse 17, it says he was running, and he knelt, and he called him good teacher. This man, even though it seemed as though he had everything, it seems as he was extremely desperate and uh, insecure about his eternal destiny. This man was empty. He was unsatisfied, and he was afraid. This man who seemed like he had it all said he was running to Jesus and knelt before him, called him good teacher. In verse 18, so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one, that is God. And Jesus isn't denying his deity here. He's not saying that he's not God, but rather he's reasoning with this man to see Jesus who he truly is. Because you guys know the story of Isaiah when he had that prophecy before he was saying, what was you, what was you, what was you? But then after he saw God clearly, then he said, woe is me, right? And for us to truly understand who we are, we have to know who God is. For us to get a clear depiction of who we are, an understanding of who we really are, we really need to know who Jesus is, who God is. Verse 19. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, Do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. So not only was this man rich and wealthy and powerful, but he was also a religious man. He's a Jew. He knew these things. And to his interpretation, he probably thought he, I didn't steal from my youth. I didn't kill anyone from my youth, right? I didn't Bear false false witness. I didn't defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And I love Aiden's Devo. Is being humble in front of people. Yeah, like maybe he 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 didn't kill anybody in the presence of people, right? But in here, we've all killed people, right? I hope there's no murders out there. But I know I actually hope there are. If you you, I hope you come to church. If yeah, this is the place for you. Okay. So if you have murdered, don't leave. We love you. And Jesus, the, yeah. But, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but in our hearts, and this is, why, this is the point, God cares about our hearts, right? Not just our actions. God also cares about our actions, but it's more about our hearts, right? If we have hate in our hearts for someone, then that's murder, right? Verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus looked at this man and had compassion on him, saw that he was empty. And he offered him something of more value than all his great possessions which was the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most infinitely more valuable thing than you could ever possess, whatever you can get on this earth, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And when you read verse 21, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross with me and follow me. I don't know if you've heard of the prosperity gospel, but this doesn't sound like it, right? To give away everything, the prosperity says if you, if you love God, then you'll be blessed with everything and you'll get all these great things and you can tell tornadoes to run away and you can, you know, all the things that, is promised with that. But here, Jesus said, is get rid of all those things and take up your cross. The cross back then wasn't what it is now, how we can wear a cross and then that like shows that you're a Christian or anything. The cross was just a form of execution, right? Jesus says, lays down your life. Lay down the things that of this world that will give you life. Money is how, what the world would say is how you get life, right? Because you need to buy a house. So you need to have shelter, you have to buy food. You have to buy water, right? You say, get rid of that stuff. Give it to the poor and follow me. And reading this, it's, it sounds familiar. So Jonah, go ahead and pull up Mark 8. So when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to, me, to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father. And Jonah, could you bring up the first verse of that again? For, oh, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. And denying yourself, there's, there's denying yourself and then there's also self-denial. Self-denial is something we, we're gonna be doing in the week of prayer and fasting when you deny something that your body needs. Maybe it's like food and maybe it's like something either like less like your phone, like you don't really need that, but sort of like a form of self-denial. But anyways, um, when you deny yourself, you're living a life that is other-centered. And instead of waking up in the morning and saying, what do I want to do today? How am I going to have fun? What sounds good to eat for me? How am I just really going to make my day awesome? Instead of living, like how can, I be, how can I be a blessing to others? How can I serve others? How can I share the love of Jesus Christ with others? How can I show love to my families, to my brothers, to my mom, to my family, to my friends? How can I be God's light for other people? And it may seem, especially from the worldview, that that denying yourself and being other-centered is going to take away from your life. But that just isn't true. And I know that because if you look around this room, there's lots of everybody here that's other-centered. And when you look at their life, you see that they're the most happy people. There's a lot of sad people in the world, but people who live for other people that's not taking anything away from your life. It's adding to your life. It's giving you life. Living other-centered. And another thing from this is, he says, come, pick up your cross, and follow me. And you can't experience a resurrected life without first dying. And Jonah, if you want to bring up Romans 6, verses 3 through 5, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism, we know that it doesn't save you. Being baptized, getting baptized is not what saves you, but baptism is rather an outward picture of an inward reality, right? So when we're baptized, that old man, that old person that we once were, was crucified with Jesus. That old person that's just sinful, only doing my will, right? 
That old person was crucified with Jesus. That's, that's the going under. You were baptized and united in his death. And then when we're brought out, it says that there's newness of life. And there's a difference. There's, and it's, it's talking about sin in Romans, how now we don't, we're not supposed to live in sin. Shall we sin now so that grace may abound? Certainly not, Paul would say. But we're also not called to just live in the ways of the world. And yes, it's, the cost is great. This man had great possessions, right? I'm sure he was very wealthy. I'm sure he owned a lot of things, a lot of camels and stuff like that, wherever it was. And it, the cost was great. Jesus said, give all those things away. Sell the poor, come follow me, pick up your cross. The cross was great. But if you want to write this down, Jesus was greater. Jesus is always greater than whatever it costs for you to follow him. The reward in Jesus is infinitely greater than anything we could ever possess. Verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of the God, to enter the kingdom of God? And the Jews at this time sort of believed in the prosperity gospel that riches and wealth and health, that was all a part of God's favor. So it says they were astonished. And I, I like to think that Judas was probably the most astonished because he was like a money guy, right? He, Jesus, Judas was a money guy. He was probably thinking, I mean, they just, they just rejected the children from coming. They're like, these guys don't have any dough. These guys aren't going to be of that much value. But then this guy comes. He's rich, powerful, well-respected guy. He's a ruler, young. They're probably like, oh, man, this guy's going to be awesome. He's gonna, he's gonna, this is a valuable asset for our team, right? Jesus, this guy's going to be awesome. He's got so much money. We're going to be able to buy T-shirts and stuff like that. It says, follow Jesus. And yeah, anyways, but that's, the guy's heart was wrong. And when I was reading this the first time, how in verse 23, how it says, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? I was like, well, praise the Lord, I'm a youth pastor, so I'm never going to be rich, right? <laughs> But then I thought of it, and I was like, you know, if, this was, if I was putting myself in his shoes right now, I could just be like FaceTiming. Hey, Jesus, how do I get into the kingdom of God? Or I could have, I don't have a one wheel. I've got an electric longboard. But if I had a one wheel, I would have one wheeled up to Jesus. But I've also got a car, which has, you know, like AC. It's probably hot in the desert back over there, wherever. The, I always think it's super hot, like wherever Jesus, in, you know, in the desert and stuff over there. But I would have had the air conditioning going and I would have rolled up to Jesus' place and I could have asked him, right? So the point is, is that we probably all have in America more luxuries than this rich guy, right? This guy was probably wearing not like Air Ones, the first Jordans, but he's probably wearing like sandal ones. I don't know, like the first sandals. They thought they were really cool. Didn't have like the rubber outsoles that we have. And anyways, we have, we're so blessed in America. We have so much there's so many things that we can enjoy here. And the point is that we aren't supposed to trust in those things. That we do have, even though we're, we may not be looked as in today's society, like I wouldn't say that I'm a rich young ruler. Um, you guys probably wouldn't say that either. But uh, I do have more riches probably than this man. So I could be easily in this guy's shoes. I could be trusting in my riches rather than in Jesus, right? I think we all can do that. And riches are dangerous for two reasons. Riches make us feel temporarily satisfied. They do. They're like, man, I've got a house and a car. This stuff is pretty awesome, one wheeling is so much fun. Snowboarding is all, there's all these cool things, especially in the snow. You can do a lot of fun things in the snow. It's easy to be temporarily satisfied with our riches and not long for heaven. You be like, why do I, why would I want more? This life is pretty awesome. It's pretty great. I'm pretty comfortable here, right? 
makes us temporarily satisfied, not long for heaven. The other thing is it makes us feel as though we're independent and that we don't need God. We don't need his help. But truly, we were created to be dependent on God. And that's the other distinction between this rich, wrong, Euler and these kids is that kids embrace their dependence. I said in first service, I wish we would have never taught my daughter how to say up. Because now it's just up, 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 up. Never stop. It's so cute. And like, I, I'm just joking. That was sort of a joke. You can laugh if you want. Don't have to. But anyways, um, she, she embraces her dependence. She always asks for things, right? Help, help. She also says help, help. And uh, we've been growing her and teaching her. We teach her how to do things so she becomes a little bit more independent. Um, I also taught her how to climb on the couch, and Jess said, I'm sorry, because uh, it makes her job a lot harder now, but it's so cute, because you can climb up on the couch and jump around, and then I say, no way, Jose, when she climbs too high, and then she's like, no way, Jose, and like, it's just so cute. Um, children are such a blessing, but that's, that's, a, that's another aspect of childlike faith that we're supposed to have. We're so dependent on, we need to be so dependent on God. Every morning, Lord... This is the day, this, oh, I can't even say it. The daily bread, sorry. We, we need to be looking to Jesus and to God. We, we, we're truly dependent on him. And that's a, that's a, that's a way of childlike faith that we're, we're called to live. And verse 25 says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So if you look up here, um, you see this hole? Do you guys think I can poke my head through this hole? No? I poked my head through the hole instead of, yeah. Anyways, my dad taught me that, and I thought it was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, Jesus, at this, at this time, the camel was like the biggest thing that they knew. I don't think they've seen elephants. Um, but the camel was the biggest thing that, they, that these guys would have known. And the sewing needle was the, the, the little hole trying to thread. You guys have done that. Maybe you haven't. But that's a really small hole, right? And that's a really big object. So he's saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That must have been pretty shocking. He's like, what? A rich man can't enter the kingdom of God? That's impossible. And verse 26 says, and they were greatly astonished saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked around at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And salvation only comes through God. It's only by trusting in Jesus. It's only by trusting in the work of the cross that Jesus came down in the likeness of, of human flesh, right? Dwelt among us, and he, he gave his life a sacrifice to save it's to save us. And John 3.16 said that we, we, just, we believe in him and we shall not perish. It's our trust in the Father. It's nothing that we do. Only God can save us. So if we're only supposed to trust in Jesus, a, a prayer that I would be praying to, and I'm, I'm, I'm praying this, but I would encourage everyone to be praying this, the new with this New Year resolution, um, th this time of New Year resolutions, is there anything that I am trusting in besides Jesus? Are there luxuries in my life that I trust in besides Jesus? Is there entertainment in my life that I trust in besides Jesus? Is there food? Whatever it is, you can fill in the blank. Am I trusting in things and being satisfied with the world and not trusting in Jesus and being dependent on him? Is there things that I'm putting before God or even next to God? God is so much higher. Jesus is so much higher. He's so much greater than all these things. Verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. 
So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So worship team, you can come on up. Um, nice ringtone. Um, God's economy is different than the world's. I love what Mark, a, Mar- a saying that Mark says is that the world's economy, you get all you can, you can all you get, and then you sit on the can and you fight anyone that like tries to come and get your things, right? But God's calling, he wants us to give, right? And something you can write down, I love this phrase, is you can never outgive God, right? When, we, when we're called to leave everything behind and follow Jesus, sometimes you're going to have to leave your family behind, right? I'm blessed. My parents and my family love Jesus. But I came here uh, four or five years ago. And when I came here, college was kind of rough because my roommates did drugs and stuff. And I had a home, though. Cody welcomed me in his home. And I'm sure, and I, I mean, I hope so. But if Cody didn't, then I'm sure a lot of other people, you might not like me, but... Uh, Maybe you would have invited me into your home, but because of, because of Jesus, the unifying work that he does by his spirit, we have so many brothers and sisters in Christ here, fathers, mothers, so many people that we can turn to. God is so generous. He's generous in his abundance. We're going to close to verse 31. But many who are first will be last and last first. So there's three stories that come to mind with this last verse. The first one is the man of the pool at Bethsaida, and you guys know that story. Um, there's this pool, and people with illnesses and disease or whatever that needed healing would come to it, and there was this angel that was supposed to come, and the water was like bubbling, and then if you were the first one in the pool, then you'd be healed, right? Um, when, when Jesus came there, there was this man in the back who wasn't the first one to the pool, he was last. He was the last one to the pool. But Jesus chose to heal that man. Another story is Mary and Martha. And you guys know that story too. When Jesus came to their house, Martha was busy serving. She was preparing all this food. She wasn't cooking ham or whatever sandwiches because they were Jewish and they wouldn't have eaten that. Sorry, Cody. But maybe they were doing chicken or something like that. And matzah bread. Or, uh, they were doing something like that. She was busy serving, sweeping the floors. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And Martha was like, Jesus, make my sister come and help me. And then Jesus was like, no, she's chosen the good portion, right? The last story is the man of the cross. And Jonah, you can put up Luke, um, the Luke verse. So then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. That's Jesus saying, blasphemed Jesus saying, if you are the Christ, Save yourself and us. But the other answering him rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And these three stories are so powerful because the first is you're not saved by, being, by striving to be first, by striving to be the best. You're not saved by serving the most, by being the most righteous, self-righteous, right? You're saved by, as this man did, surrendering to your savior. savior. This man recognized, dude, we both are deserving of this punishment, but this man's not recognizing that it, it is, it's a surrender, seeing who yourself, who you truly are. And I was curious of what surrender, what, it, what the dictionary word of surrender is defined, and it's from the Oxford Dictionary. It says, cease resistance to an enemy or opponent in submitting to their authority. I'll repeat that. Cease resistance to an enemy or opponent and submit to their authority. Jonah, you can pull up Matthew 9. 
verses 10 through 13. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The gospel is for the last. It's for the lowly. It's for the lost. It's not for the people who go and get it and claim it for themselves. That's, that's, that's not what the gospel is. It's not, you need to try your best to get into heaven. The gospel is, it's for the low people, the humble people, as Aiden was saying, the people who surrender. It's in our surrender to Jesus, knowing who we truly are and knowing who he truly is, who Jesus is, what, what the price that he paid on the cross for us. That's how we're saved, is by putting our faith in Jesus. And if you have nothing but Jesus, then you have everything. Look at the, look at, we're going to go back into verse 22. It says, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. If you choose this world, this man chose the world. He chose the earthly satisfaction that he had, the earthly wealth that he had instead of choosing the life of Jesus. And he went away sad and sorrowful. He was so close to Jesus. If we choose this world, it's always going to leave us empty. It's always going to leave us satisfied. We're always going to be sorrowful. But if we choose Jesus, we're truly satisfied. He's the only one that can fill us. He's the only one that can satisfy us. He's the only one that can save us. And there's no better way to start the new year than being saved or starting to live your resurrected life that Jesus wants you to live. We're going to end with Revelations 3, 14 through 20. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chast, and therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And the amazing thing is we serve a God who's living. God's not done working. Just as that man thought he was, he was at the end, that man who's being crucified, it's not too late. Let 2022 be the start of your, of your resurrected life. And I believe that God is knocking on the hearts of the doors of your hearts today. And we at ACF, we as Christians, we love to accept people into our family. And if you feel the Lord's knocking on your heart, he's drawing to you to him, he wants you to be saved. Maybe he wants you to let go of some things. We're going to be standing up here and you can come receive prayer. If you have never received Jesus, we'd love to, re- to pray with you, to welcome you into the family, to rejoice with you. And maybe there's some things maybe that you need to let go that you've been trusting in besides Jesus. I'd love to come talk to you and pray with you for that. So we'll be up here as Jerry closes the last song.